Hello, my name is Alex Oltan. I'm a master's student in the first year at the University of Bucharest, which is also the place where I'm currently recording from. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. My presentation will be about actually the topic of my bachelor's thesis, which I just finished last semester. Um, and that is uh, formalization of uh, hybrid model logic in Lean and some steps towards uh, formalizing its, uh, its completeness proof. Um, so just to give a very brief introduction into hybrid logic and uh, why this subject seemed uh, interesting um, and why my advisor, uh, Professor Lorenzo Leustan, suggested it to me. Um, so hybrid logic was introduced by Arthur Pryor, who was one of the philosopher logicians. He was actually interested in studying the nature of time and finding a suitable formalism for uh, expressing temporal statements. And one of his intuitions about, one of the relevant intuitions to hybrid logic that he had about temporal statements is that they are true at exactly one point in time. And uh, that differs from regular uh, statements of facts. Uh, for example, a statement like, Alex is giving a talk is not confined to any one particular point in time. It could be true in the future or at any other point. But if I, a statement like it is the 7th of January, while still expressing the statement of time, uh, a statement of fact um, is somehow glued to, to the temporal date of 7 January. It cannot be true unless the actual state of the world is actually 7th of January. Uh, and it turns out that this intuition about temporal statements has a very uh, neat uh, formalization using uh, model logic tools, as we will see when we get to the, to the semantics. But really, the direction from which I got into this, and the reason why my advisor uh, suggested this topic, was not so much philosophical, but because there is a uh, formal system used in uh, software verification, there is a logic called matching logic, which um, has been shown to be equivalent um, to a more generalized, general type of hybrid logic, but many sorted polyadic hybrid logic, but which bears many similarities to the logic that I worked with. Uh, and so uh, having uh, properties of hybrid logic formalized uh, on a computer delivers the promise of maybe uh, being able to transfer some of those, those results back to matching logic. So uh, that's, that's why it was interesting in this department to study hybrid logic. Uh, now, what I did was um, take a paper by Blackburn and Sakova who described one of the variants of hybrid logic and prove its soundness and completeness properties. And I tried to uh, translate it in, uh, in Lean uh, to formalize the paper, basically. Now, uh, all of these references I will uh, list in detail at the end, if you're interested in reading more about this stuff. Um, but let's uh, focus on the language itself. So let's see how the syntax is defined. There are three kinds of um, symbols in hybrid logic. There are propositional symbols, there are state variables, and uh, there are nominals. And in a way, these three kinds of symbols do behave similarly in that we can get well-formed formulas from any of these three. So a variable, a state variable makes a well-formed formula in hybrid logic. But at the same time, uh, variables and nominals also behave like terms. So uh, uh, we can bind variables with a quantifier and then maybe use nominals to do substitutions or um, to instantiate formulas just as we would use constants in first order logic. So in this sense, um, hybrid logic makes a hybridization between formulas and terms. Um, and it also, syntactically at least, it seems like a hybrid between uh, model logic and first order logic because we have the model box operator and also we are able to 
bind variables, but binding works very differently than it works in first order logic. So we do not have a domain of objects. We don't quantify over things. Um, when I reach semantical part, uh, this will become more, more clear. Uh, but for now, let's look at how I implemented this in Lean. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the only thing to note is that um, prop and SVAR being uh, the numerably infinite sets, I formalized this as in the set of letters that they can uh, express is indexed by the natural number. So I wrote a structure around the naturals. And as for the nominals, since they can be finite, then that means they can be indexed by a subset of the of the natural number. So I use the sets in in method for doing this. And then the definition of formulas follows uh, follows pretty immediately. All right, uh, now to get the semantics, since this is a model logic, we use the basic model tools for defining uh, truth uh, and uh, defining satisfaction. And that is, uh, we interpret formulas over Kripke models and Kripke frames. We have a set of nodes, or maybe I will call them worlds or states, which is W. And we, we, we have a binary relation between uh, nodes which is the accessibility relation of the frame. And then we uh, evaluate symbols, propositional and nominal symbols to subsets of the set of states. Now, uh, Prior's intuition about temporal statements being true at exactly one point is only fulfilled if we constrain valuations to evaluate nominals so not propositional symbols, but only nominals to ev evaluate them to singleton sets of, of the power set of W. So uh, they are true at just one point in, in, in the model. Now, since this is a quantified language in a sense, since it features binding, we also borrow assignment functions from uh, the semantics of uh, first order logic which behave very similar to, uh, to valuations in the model. Uh, and we, um, we constrain them in the same way to only interpret variables uh, to singleton sets. So no variable can be true at multiple states at, at once if the, if the assignment is standard. And we care about standard valuations, standard models, and standard assignments. This is what we work with. Um, so, um, oh, right, the satisfaction relation. I thought uh, it was the, the formalization already, but not, not yet. Um, yeah, with this on hand, we, like the clauses for satisfaction should not be very surprising because they're very similar from model and uh, classical logic. The only difference being, once again, that we don't have a domain. So a quantification doesn't, um, uh, evaluate, uh, doesn't assign variables to objects, but rather when we interpret a variable, we glue it to some state uh, in W. And when we quantify over, uh, over uh, variables, then we let the state that the variable X denote, we let that vary. So, um, in a sense, the only entities that this kind of quantification needs are already provided for by the Kripke model in which we interpret. So variables denote states, denote nodes in the Kripke frame. Um, all right, now let's look at uh, how I translated this in Lean. Again, pretty straightforward. Um, the only thing to note is that um, I use two different functions, uh, two different valuation functions, one for propositional symbols, the other for nominals. Um, that was easiest. Uh, mathematically, uh, they are defined on the union, but it was easier to just have two different, uh, different uh, functions. And uh, that's about it. Uh, by default, the models as I have defined them and the assignment functions, the interpretation functions uh, are standard. So they map symbols, nominals and variables, they map state symbols to exactly one by default. So there are not any non-standard uh, models 
in this formalization, at least not yet, because I had to implement them at some further point. But I, I didn't know that when I was doing this. <laughs> that's, the, that's the disadvantage of uh, of learning as you as you go. You don't have the foresight necessary to 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 know what kind of things you will need in the future. But I will get to that. All uh, right. Now for the proof system, there are seven axioms which regulate how hyperlogic works on a syntactic level. Um, but only, I guess, two of them, maybe even the last one, only these ones are specific to hyperlogic. The first one just, um, uh, so all propositional tautologies, all, so hyperlogic includes the uh, propositional logic then uh, it includes uh, normal model logic. It has the axiom K of normal model logic, so it's built upon uh, model logic. Uh, axioms Q1 and Q2, maybe not in every system they're taken as axioms, but they are theorems of classical logic, of first order logic. They regulate the usage of uh, quantifiers. And then indeed we have axiom name and norm, which are hybrid. They are the syntactic counterpart to the semantic intuition that variables and nominals should denote states in the in the Kripke frame. So axiom name states that every node in the frame uh, can be referred to by some uh, uh, variable. So every every state has a name, basically. Uh, and axiom norm uh, states that state symbols name uniquely. So there are not there are not two distinct states that are referred to by the same state symbol, by the same variable, or we can then instantiate this and uh, they are not referred to by the same nominal either. This is the... Blackburn calls it the model, the hybrid theory of labeling. It is contained in these two axioms. And then we have the axiom uh, Barkan, named after uh, Ruf Barkan Marcus, uh, that uh, the model, the box operator and the uh, universal binder commute. This is very controversial <laughs> in, uh, in uh, quantified model logic. It was the subject of a very heated uh, series of papers between uh, Hein and uh, Rufbark and Marcus, but since we don't have any domain, since we this is not quantified model logic, uh, in um, in hybrid logic, uh, it's completely uncontroversial and it's it's in fact an axiom. All right. Um, oh, and we also have the uh, the rules of uh, the inference, uh, model exponents. Uh, generalization as in um, first order logic and necessitation as in uh, model logic. So again, a hybrid between classical and model uh, uh, things. Um, and all of this translates to an inductive type in, in lean. Once again, the way I translated this is pretty straightforward. I won't uh, spend too much time on it, but of course I had to define tautologies, which I did um, the semantic way. So I, I have a different, I have a definition of tautology, which uh, presupposes that there is a notion of evaluation functions and that uh, there is an evaluation uh, that any evaluation renders a fee true. So this has, this had to be done uh, on the, uh, on the side. So I, I haven't put it in the slides, but it had to be written as I had to write as well definition for free variables, for um, safe substitution, for substitutability, and so on. So many small things, as you might be very <laughs> well aware that are necessary when you formalize. Uh, um, even if this looks uh, pretty straightforward, uh, it's not really. So <laughs> there were many more other things involved in the background. All right. Uh, but even with just having these basic definitions uh, down, uh, I could already prove some interesting things. I could prove uh, the deduction theorem. Um, I could prove afterwards uh, derived uh, uh, rules of inference. 
Uh, and using these, uh, there were many um, uh, theorems of uh, hybrid logic, which could be just proved uh, right away after defining the proof system. Um, but really what I, what I cared about was uh, soundness and completeness. So not as much uh, hybrid theorems, but meta theorems. So I cared about linking uh, syntax and semantics. And soundness, once again, didn't raise any serious problems. Um, I could basically just follow the pen and paper proof given by Blackburn and Sakova in the paper that I mentioned. And um, that was it. Uh, I, well, all I had to do was induction on the inductive types, pattern matching basically on the inductive types that I, that I defined earlier and uh, the same um, lemmas and techniques that uh, were used mathematically could be very well transferred uh, to lean and uh, it, it it was pretty it's a pretty good mirror image what i formalized of what is in the paper so there's that but not the same can be said about completeness and uh, here things get more interesting you know it's boring when you know, <laughs> at least for me when you talk about how things went smoothly it's less boring when you talk about the troubles that you met um so not the same can be said about completeness. Completeness wasn't as straightforward, which somehow is to be expected because com completeness proofs are mathematically more involved than the soundness proofs. But even in the sense that um, the formalization of the, of the proof in lean uh, follows or does not clearly follow the pen and paper proof, uh, completeness was more complicated. So the way completeness can be done using my formalization is not a mirror image of the mathematical proof that uh, uh, Blackburn and Sakova give. So uh, different techniques need to be used. And uh, just to make things clear, I haven't finished this part because uh, it wasn't entirely clear to me how it can be done, uh, but just to give a small outline of uh, of what completeness uh, uh, involves for uh, for for hybrid logic, as should be already expected by this point, um, completeness uh, you know is proved using a mixture of classical and model techniques. Uh, I wanted to highlight actually this one. So a mixture of classical and model techniques. Um, model, uh, modally speaking, we define a construction known as the canonical model, uh, which is common in all model logics. Uh, but there are some slight um, um, things that have to be uh, taken care of when using the canonical model because it's not a standard model in the way that I defined it a bit earlier. Um, but I implemented the canonical model and its uh, polishings, uh, the way Blackburn does it, pretty straightforwardly once again. So if the criteria, the criterion of how easy the formalization was, was its perceived distance from the mathematical proof, then even if the canonical model and the witnessed and completed model constructions were a bit more mathematically involved, um, they were still easy. So they were very close to, to what Blackburn did and um, they didn't raise any significant problems. But I don't want to get into the detail, but uh, we use maximal consistent sets in these models, which uh, which we use in the completeness proof. And maximal the existence of maximal consistent sets is traditionally proved using Lindenbaum's lemma, which states that any consistent set at all can be extended into a set that is maximally consistent. Um, this is very standard. This step is necessary in basically any completeness uh, uh, theorem that I know of. So even in a propositional logic, uh, everyone uses Lindemann's lemma. In um, first order logic and in hybrid logic, 
We also need a stronger statement of Lindenbaum, which uh, after extending the consistent set also makes sure that every existential formula in the respective set is instantiated, is witnessed by some nominals. And this is specific to classical logic and to hybrid, as it turns out. And um, from Lindenbaum on, uh, there start to be some, some points of departure from, uh, from the mathematical proof. So I didn't manage to prove the extended version, the one that needs witnesses, but I did manage to prove the, the regular version. And in a way which, um, you know, most people, most formalizations that I have seen for various logics um, use Schron's lemma. Because normally to prove Lindenbaum, you need to enumerate the formulas of the language and you need to construct a sequence of sets um, by adding each formula or not adding it to, to, uh, to one of the, of the set in the sequences. So, uh, but that's easy to do on paper because we know languages are uh, countable. We know we can enumerate them. It's complicated to do on, on, on a computer because we need to prove countability. So usually the method that I have seen also because Schron's lemma is well implemented, it has a lot of variants and useful uh, 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 so interfaces. There is a there are many useful interfaces to Schron's lemma in MathLib. The way I have usually seen Lindenbaum's lemma proved for various logics in Lean was non-constructively circumventing the need for an explicit uh, enumeration of, of, uh, of formulas. I also toyed around with it. I, I saw that it's possible, but I wanted to stick as close as possible to what was happening mathematically because usually formulas are enumerated if they can be enumerated. So I tried to avoid the easy solution of using Tsorn. So I tried to enumerate the formulas I did prove uh, that the type of formulas is countable. Um, uh, so I defined an instance of countable. There are many flavors of countability in MathLib, but I chose to use countable because that seemed like the less, it involved the, less, the least effort. Um, and I did this in maybe, um, may seem unintuitive at first. I wrote an injection from formulas to lists of four dimensional natural numbers, but really it's not all that un unintuitive. Uh, this is the intuition. Uh, wait, let me, let me show the formalization because it's clear like this. Uh, the intuition is as follows. We have three different sorts of symbols, uh, propositional variables and nominals. In order to write an injection more easily, it's helpful to be able to distinguish between them. So I put them on different dimensions of these four dimensional numbers. So I use three dimensions to distinguish between the three kinds of propositional symbols. And I use the fourth dimension, this one, to signify the kind of operator by which compound formulas are introduced and uh, the bottom is just translated to one on this dimension. So that's that's where the four dimensions come from. Um, having them as list is pretty, I guess, intuitive because uh, we usually see formulas. We're used to thinking of them as strings, as list of charts of characters. So of course uh, we expect them to be listable somehow. Uh, now, the reason why I didn't write a direct, so uh, uh, at least one of the reasons why I didn't write a direct uh, 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 injection between formulas and strings is because strings are actually not countable, or at least no instance of countable for string has been proven in Lean for some reason. So uh, no, I couldn't just go the usual uh, Gyodel method about it. I would love to get into more detail, but I will just mention that as strange as it might seem, this works. 
I managed to prove countability. Using countability, I managed to prove the regular version of Lindenbaum's lemma. So any consistent set can be extended to one that is maximally consistent. Um, and this is the construction. I, I'd love to get into more detail, but as I said, it's more interesting to focus on what didn't work. And what didn't work was the extended version that I mentioned earlier. The, the theorem that every consistent set can be expanded not just to an MCS, but to one that is witnessed. One that has a witness for every uh, nominal, for every existential in the set. Now, the problem is usually that uh, there may not be enough nominals, not enough constants in the language. This is common to first order proofs as well. And what is done on paper is that the language is expanded with a denumerable infinity of new nominal symbols. And then we, we have the certainty that we can instantiate all existential uh, formulas in a consistent manner with these nominals because they're completely new. And so we actually expand, we all actually build the witnessed maximal consistent set in an expanded language. Of course, then we have to prove that whatever holds in the expanded language, as long as uh, it is restricted to symbols in the original language, also holds in the original language. So there are many smaller steps, but this is the general method by, this is, by, by which this is done. Now, step one is very complicated. <laughs> I have to, to, to uh, say I got stuck at this for a long time. Yeah. But in the way in which I defined formulas, the language of hybrid logic, it is very complicated. Actually, it's impossible to expand the language with more symbols. It gets impossible at some point. There is a maximal language. There is a language which can, which can no longer be expanded. And that is, so I index nominals by sets of, no, by sets of natural numbers. But uh, the language which cannot be expanded anymore is that in which the index set is the natural numbers itself. The set of natural numbers, the total set of natural numbers. So uh, the type of formulas in which nominals are bijective with the natural numbers cannot be extended any further. So it contains all the nominals it could possibly contain. Uh, this is the way sets work in MATLAB. Uh, it already, already contains all the terms of its type and it cannot have terms of other types. Sets are homogeneous. So this cannot be extended and it needs to be extended, at least in the usual proof as is given in textbooks and in papers. Even this language, countable, the enumerable language needs to be expanded. So what do? Do you just scrap the formalization? Can we save it? Well, I did come up. I think the answer is yes, we can save it, but I don't have all of this reasoning formalized. It's not in lean at the moment. Uh, we can take advantage of some properties of infinite sets. Uh, and in particular, we can take advantage of something which is known, more commonly known as Hilbert's paradox of the infinite hotel, which is a very trivial fact about infinite sets. Um, that uh, if you, uh, translate an infinite set by a bijective mapping, then you make room practically for an infinity of uh, new elements. Uh, so my intuition was that we could do this in, uh, in the case of sets of formulas as well. So if, if we have a set of formulas which, uh, uses all the nominals available in the language, but we trans we rewrite all the formulas in such a way that the nth nominals is substituted everywhere by the 
2n plus 1n uh, nominal, then in the resulting set, even if there were no available nominals none, uh, to be used in the, in the original set, in the extended set, we actually have made room for an infinity of new unused nominals because we have translated, we have mapped everything so as to make room for an infinity of new nominals. Um, and we are free to use the even nominals in this case to, to witness the existentials as we need in the Lindenbaum proof. This is the idea. The question is if this kind of mapping preserves provability. So the question is this, if phi is a theorem, is the mapping of phi to odd nominals still a theorem? And uh, this as well. So if we can deduce phi from a set of hypotheses, can you still deduce it uh, after you apply this transformation? Well, I managed to prove this one. So I have this formalized. Uh, but because the way that this rewriting of nominals ha has been formalized by me in Lean because the, its implementation is quite cumbersome, so not very immediate. Um, Trivial facts about it, which should be absolutely evident, such as this one, <laughs> actually become not very evident at all. And um, theorems that depend on this fact are actually, you know, not proved in, in totality. So there are things that are still missing. Um, so this proof relies on the fact that uh, on on this fact, which I have left unproved unfortunately <laughs> so uh, yeah that's i think the all the troubles i got into with uh, infinite sets and uh, expanding them um is really a consequence of the fact that i didn't have a very clear outlook on this of this uh, proof that I was trying to formalize and of the language and of what the language can do lean when I was just starting out because once again I was learning the language as I was formalizing the logic and um, lean has helped me a lot I, it was a very great didactic tool uh, it made me see all the small details necessary and prove them uh, with a degree of uh, of rigor, which I might have missed had I not been using uh, Lean. Uh, but at the same time, um, it was difficult to foresee these problems. And once I reached this trouble with the extended Lindenbaum lemma, it was also very complicated to rewrite the definition of the language in such a way as to make the dilemma work easier. So um, yeah, uh, it helps to to not use it, to not use Lean in, in a didactic way. If you really want to reach a result in a limited amount of time, uh, it helps to have an amount of foresight. Uh, anyway, um, I do have an outline for how this proof should look like. I do believe these properties hold. It's just that time is uh, finite in practice and uh, uh, I didn't get to, to formalize all that was to formalize. So the completeness proofs is still missing the details on the extended level, unfortunately. So uh, that's it. <laughs> that's what I had to, to present to you. Thank you a lot for listening. Um, I'll see you on Gather on Wednesday, uh, the Q&A session. And here are also the references for <laughs> uh, the ones of you who are interested.